Oh, there you go. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, uh, thanks everybody. Um, so we're going to turn the page here a little bit. Um, so um, as Tony say, well, I come from uh, from a winery, from a fairly large winery, uh, Gallo Winery, based in Modesto. Although we um, have vineyards um, all over the state of California. And my, my intention uh, today will be to talk to you guys about a little bit of the work we're doing in remote sensing. Um, we started about three years ago doing, um, first we started uh, just purchasing images um, um, through CBAL, uh, CBAL North America. And now we're doing a little bit more and more work in-house. Um, so, you know, keep in mind that uh, I will try to focus this on, um, hmm, this was working before on the industry perspective. So this will be a little bit different from the, the previous um, speakers. Um, just to give you an idea who we are, um, here's a map of um, California um, highlighting a few of the regions where we have our vineyards. And these, these points here are a few of our, our properties, although we have a lot of vine um, pretty much anywhere inside e each of these three areas we have vineyards. Uh, we manage about um, uh, 1.2 million tons per year. Um, we do 160,000 plus acres per year, um, which roughly 60, 65,000 hectares. Um, value translated that to, to a value is probably it's close to a billion dollars per, per year. So it's a pretty pretty good size um, operation. And um, I do want to stress the point that we have vineyards in very different growing conditions. Um, so the implications of um, you know weather differences from from location to location. Are, are very significant, and that's one of the reasons why we decided to move to remote sensing. After years and years of spending a lot of money taking, um, you know, very, very um, accurate, but very uh, spot measurements, basically in, in a few vineyards, and then trying to translate that to all over the place. Well, we decided to go with remote sensing, which makes a lot more sense. Um, we we're all aware of this. Um, you know, even in California, this is just a. Um, a download from Shulai. Um, again, the areas that, that we, we, we will have our vineyards are mainly the Central Valley here, uh, the Napa and Sonoma North Coast region, and the Central Coast of California. Um, areas that are, this past year were very affected by drought. So during the, during the winter, we didn't get nearly as much rainfall as, as we normally do. Um, how much water, why do we care about this? So how much water our vineyards use on average? And again, averages are perhaps not, not always good, but just to give you kind of an idea of where we are, um, about, about um, um, a half a million gallons per, per year per acre. Um, so it's, it's quite, a bit of, quite a bit of water. Uh, when you translate that to 160,000 acres, it's, we're talking about a lot of water that we use as a company. Um, so the benefits of saving, let's say, 10, 20% of water, when you translate that to uh, numbers, to dollars, um, it is very significant. Um, a little bit of background, and, and again, moving to the, the wine industry here and what has been used uh, traditionally. Um, people have um, traditionally scheduled irrigation using, don't laugh, but visual observations. Uh, do the vines look happy or not? Do they need water or not? You know, it's sad but true. And, and a lot of people still do that. Um, <clears throat> um, there are some measurements of water stress. Um, the, mo the most famous probably tool is the pressure pressure chamber, pressure bomb. Some people use barometers. Some people use uh, ear gas. Um, there's soil moisture sensors. And there's, there's quite a bit of evapotranspiration work. Although, unfortunately, in the wine industry, most of the evapotranspiration work has been, um, in my opinion, it hasn't, it hasn't, been, properly, hasn't been properly used. So basically, people have taken. For example, crop coefficients develop in, in very warm regions, in very uh, vineyards that receive a lot of water, where your canopies are very large. And they try to use those numbers statewide. And when things don't work, they blame the evapotranspiration model, saying, well, it doesn't work. Well, again, you know, it's, it's a misunderstanding of, of you know, how, how, how things work in the field. Uh, more recently, um, that's, that's what, what we're doing right now. I started with CBAL and then moving slowly towards metric. And from a practical point of view, and that's what I'm going to focus this, this presentation, is that, that ratio between NDVI and the basal crop coefficient. Again, keep in mind that we are a private company and we're trying to use all these, all these technologies for irrigation management. So we basically, our end goal is to tell a grower that has, uh, that has a given vineyard anywhere in the state 
how many hours of water he needs to apply, let's say, on a per weekly basis. So we're no longer doing uh, water budgets. We need to be able to tell them exactly how much water they need to apply. <clears throat> Again, field measurements, you know, we spend a lot of money, a lot of time as, a, as, a, as, as, it, as an industry on these, uh, on these tools that might be accurate, but they only give you a spot measurements. And there, there's no way really to extrapolate any of these, any of these things to, uh, to the entire field. Uh, again, the pressure bomb that I was saying, uh, soil moisture, the so-called visual, visual observations that I was talking before, uh, subflow sensors, again, very, very expensive. Um, it, it is kind of amazing that people will um, you know, spend a lot of money installing these in a few vines on a, on a given vineyard and then um, you know, schedule irrigation on the basis of just that. Um, but it, it is what it is. Um, we do use all these tools internally in our research department to validate our remote sensing tools. But we don't, we don't intend to use any of these for irrigation scheduling. Um, it wouldn't be possible to, to cover 160,000 acres of subflow sensors. There's, there's no way. Uh, I can almost buy my own satellite with the amount of money that I had to spend for subflow, basically. Um, so remote sensing, I'm, I'm sure all of you are, are, are very familiar with, all, with these two uh, very key papers of, uh, you know, the, the metric model and the SIBA model. Um, Dr. Rick Allen already went through this, so I'm, I'm not going to spend any time here. Um, the challenges that we have in vineyards, and in vineyards, you know, when you drive around a vineyard, everything looks very uniform. All the vines look pretty much the same, and then as soon as you, you, um, you step out of your, your car, your truck, your um, van, whatever you're driving, and then you start walking inside a row, you see a lot of variability. So that's, that's the biggest enemy we have. Here's just an NDVI map showing a lot of variability within each vineyard. And that is just a, a, a map of a percentage of clay, basically, for, for basically these vineyards here. So you see a lot of variability. Why am I showing you this? Um, is because one of, the, one of the biggest enemies we have in, in, in the vineyard, in the wine industry, is we use drip irrigation. And it is a good tool to save water, to improve water um, efficiency, water use efficiency. But keep this in mind. When you turn the water on, every single vine will receive the same amount of water, let's say on a per hour basis. So every single vine has one or two drippers that are going to irrigate the root system. They could be half a gallon per hour or one gallon per hour. You turn the water on, every single vine gets the same amount of water. So you have these differences in vine vigor, obviously on ET as well, you're still irrigating the same. Not only you're irrigating every single vine the same, but you're applying fertilizer through the drip system. So every single vine gets the same amount of fertilizer too. So think about the, the inac inaccuracies of, of this system. So drip, drip irrigation has been a great help, but it's also a, a big, big, um, um, I don't want to call it an enemy, but, but a big obstacle that we have to save in terms of water, water use efficiency. And we're trying to find ways to do that. Um, I just want to show a few pictures of you know, vineyard variability. And, and again, the, the wine industry, it's, it's a great um, industry to work in terms of research because we cover such a large, um, such a wide range of um, growing conditions and also canopy kind of microclimates too. So we, we the, 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 the first um, mm. problem that we see is that we have this space here in between our vines that we usually grow we might grow a cover crop, we say. In some cases, we like that cover crop to use some of the, some of the moisture in the ground so the vines don't, don't overgrow. But uh, think about the implications of having this crop that also consumes water when you're trying to use Landsat pixels 30 by 30 meters. You're really not able to, to separate in between the cover crop and your vines. There are, there are vineyards that do not have, you know, um, the same type of trellis. There are probably around 50 different trellis systems that we have internally. There are probably around 300 cultivars that we have internally that we grow, and they all respond differently to water stress. So pretty much 99% of our vineyards are all under drip irrigation, and they're all also under um, deficit irrigation. So um, in contrast to what most of the speakers talk through the day, we want water stress. We, we are not even close to the full ET um, level, and we, we don't want to be there. Um, you know, there, there's a very clear relationship between quality and, and water stress, so we want to be able to manage water stress. We don't want too much water stress, but we want a little bit of it. So I guess the, the one thing that you can, you can think about is, 
in terms of wine quality, uh, you can go to the store and buy a $2 bottle of wine, and you can buy a $150 bottle of wine. In order to make one or the other, the, the management in the field is completely different. The yield that you're going to get on, on, on a given vineyard will have an effect on that as well. Um, again, more pictures of how, how do we arrange our vines to grow. And all these things are going to affect you know, our estimates of ET, how much our vines grow, how much uh, of the leaf area is really exposed, um, how much uh, crop we have in our vines. And most of these, most of these um, arrangements will have this cover crop using water. How much water that cover crop uses, um, there's no real good data in vineyards. There's some estimates that up to at least 20% of the water can be used by the cover crop. Um, then we do a lot of management in the field. Um, this thing is for, for the, so, uh, those of you that you haven't seen, basically what we're doing here is we're sucking the leaves basically and, and cutting them. So we're basically opening the canopy mm -hmm. to promote light exposure, to promote um, um, <coughs> cluster exposition to light. That improves color, mouthfeel, wine quality. So um, think about this. In the past, when people tried to use those standard, so-called standard crop coefficients, they never accounted for any of these manipulations. So you might go one day and decide to pull 30% of the leaf area in order to, to open the canopy. So think about the effect that that's going to have on, on, on evapotranspiration, on your crop coefficient. That has never been accounted for in the wine industry in California, at least. Uh, and you know, people. Took the, took the easy route of just blaming the, the ET model as, as well, it doesn't work. Um, so there's a lot of things that we do in the vineyard that will affect that. Um, when I started talking internally inside the company about remote sensing and satellite imagery, people look at me like I was, like I was crazy. Um, you know, when you, when you look in, around the industry and you talk to people that don't know, that don't have the technical background about, about um, you know, remote sensing um, at all, um, you know, they, they have a hard time believing that you can do that from a space. Um, so we had to go and, and validate the, some of these things to show people that, that it really works. Um, and we followed first a very, very simple approach. Um, so again, I'm not, I'm not showing you any rocket science here, but this is a very as simple as it can get. Um, there's a professor at, at UC Davis that developed this equation between ground, ground coverage, or, or what he called percent of shaded area and the basal crop coefficient. And in vineyards, he showed, um, you know, co correlating that on a, on a lysimeter, that there's more or less a linear relationship. So our approach was going to be to go to multiple spots within vineyards and, and covering multiple vineyards and measure this thing to get here. And then compare that value versus what we were getting out of Seabal, for example. Um, this is how, you know, in the industry, probably one of the best uh, tools, again, don't, don't laugh too much about this thing, but it's just basically a solar panel that is capturing how much radiation is going through the canopy. So you basically measure radiation above the canopy and below the canopy and account for all these holes, all these gaps that are, um, again, think about a, a vine. Um, the canopy on a vine has not been a solid structure. It, it allows for light to go through. So you have to account for that. Um, because we were covering very, very large areas, and this is one example of vineyards where we were measuring these things on, on these squares here, um, <clears throat> we, you know, we needed to have quite a few people out there, and probably the cheapest option that we could think of to, to measure this thing was, was this device. I'm not going to claim that it's the most accurate, but, but it seems to work okay. Just to show you a difference, how, 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 how much do things really vary out there in terms of uh, crop, basal crop coefficient? A very high yielding um, Cabernet vineyard um, that is going to produce probably a five dollar to the bottle um, wine, versus um, you know a, a less vigorous um, vineyard that is going to produce probably a fifteen to twenty twenty dollar bottle of wine. You have a thirty percent difference on the crop coefficients. Um, imagine that before we never accounted for this, um, we were using just the standard crop coefficients that didn't didn't really uh, show any difference between one or the other. Um, so when we, when we did this and we, we, we went to these vineyards and we tried to validate them, uh, we found out that the, the Seabal estimates that we were getting um, were, were very, very accurate. We did it across multiple var, uh, cultivars. Um, for those, uh, some, some of you that might be uh, wine, wine drinkers, it sounds like, like Tony is. Um, so Chardonnay, <coughs> Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Petit Syrah, Pinot Noir, Riesling, uh, Symphony, and Syrah. And across all, the bar, uh, across all of these cultivars, and, and again, multiple, multiple vineyards, 
um, the average error was plus minus 5%. So we were pretty happy with that, to be honest with you. Keep in mind that this is just a, a, a basal um, crop coefficient. Um, what are the implications of this variability? And I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try to go quickly through a few of these things. So why do we care about this? Uh, and now I'm gonna jump to something completely different as, 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 as this yield or yield map. We have a vineyard here that is about 40 acres, so medium, medium to small size. Look at the variability on yield here. So for, I'm not sure that you can really read that, but the, the red number is about 3.8 tons, tons to the acre. The green is 18 in the same vineyard. So this is the same trellis, the same cultivar, the same rootstock, the same management. Right now we're doing the same management. So all the vineyard gets managed the same way. So um, we, you know, before we never had, it, we never had any, any tools to say, to maybe do differential management on these areas that are weaker versus the areas that are more vigorous. Um, but the implications in terms of yield and also in terms of quality, imagine that if yield changes, so it's gonna do uh, quality. And so it's gonna do things like NDVI or, or uh, SAVI, which is another index that we, we use internally. Um, so we wanted to calibrate these, um, these um, basal crop coefficients, basically or KCBs, uh, obtaining via, via the CBAL model with NDVI. And why do we wanna do that? Is because we have way too many acres to cover and, and only a few days on the week where we can work on all these data. So we wanted to get a shortcut basically um, to, to be able to, to push this data out to growers. And um, unfortunately, um, you know, running, sometimes running the entire CBAL or running the entire metric model, it wasn't gonna be an option for us internally because, you know, we had to cover a very, very large number of acres. Um, so <clears throat> we did it for 200 vineyards. Uh, we did it in three dates each and on all these uh, cultivars again. And we got something like this, uh, which we were pretty, pretty happy again. Uh, this was in 2011 with Landsat 5, when Landsat 5 was operational. And we got an R square of 0.93. Of course, there, there's a few you know, points that are uh, outliers and I'll, and I'll try to explain on, on what happened there. Um, but we were pretty happy on this, on the KCV relationship with NDVI. And that's, this is something that we use today, not because it's the most accurate thing ever, but because in terms of practicality, you know, it, has a, it has a huge um, value for us. Um, how do we use this? Um, and I don't know if you can really see, this is the kind of slide that it never shows up well in a, in a presentation. But uh, um, this is a, just a pixelated area where we have developed our, our KCB values. And this is a single vineyard. And we can see areas that are darker green versus um, you know, darker brown. So this is right now, again, drip irrigation. The rows are gonna run this way to, to, um, from north to south. And right now, every single vine is receiving the same amount of water and the same amount of fertilizer because, because it is drip irrigation. So what we're trying to do now is basically trying to divide the irrigation systems to account for these variabilities. So we can only do these things to having you know, remote sensing. We could have never done this. But, but think about the, the water savings, the yield implications, the quality implications. So there, there's, a, there's a, a very promising f future. I'm not, I'm not claiming that this is very easy to do because another, another disadvantage of the drip irrigation system is, is a permanent structure. So once you plant the vineyard, you're hoping that you're gonna maintain the vineyard alive for at least 40, 50 years, 30 years maybe, um, at least. Uh, there's a lot of wires on the way, there's a lot of hosing, there's, there's you know, it, it's, a, it's a permanent structure. So it's not as easy as, um, let's say on a cornfield, going and watering more or less um, certain areas of, of the field. This, this is a little bit more challenging, but we are doing it. And in this case, you know, the, again, the KCV goes from 0.5 to one. Um, you know, we, as, as I said before, we use internally other tools only for, for validation of these technologies. Uh, uh, Subflow has been around for the last 20 years, basically. I just wanted to show you this again, how variable a vineyard can be. This is on a, on a, on a, on a single vineyard, uh, two different areas within the vineyard, high vigor area and a low vigor area. And there's, you know, twice as much subflow basically on that high vigor area compared to the, to the low vigor area. Um, I think again that um, unless you, you're able to manipulate the irrigation system, all these, these two areas will get the same amount of water as soon as you turn the water on. So very, very, very inefficient. Um, canopy temperature, um, I did a little bit of work with Dr. Shons in Lin Shons in, in Australia. You know, he has this balloon where has a, he has an infrared camera attached to it and, and you're hoping that there's no wind that day otherwise you're gonna go, um, you know, find it very, very far away. But, you know, it, it is a, 
it is a it is a, a tool to to um to um accurately um estimate water stress although for our, for our extent you know for for the amount of acres that we manage um i think it's impractical uh, other things like just the infrared cameras where you can go and take a single picture of a vine again a research tool but for 160,000 acres i can i can't have enough people and enough cameras out there to take take <coughs> take pictures um so definitely we were interested on um, using more and more of the thermal data coming out of Landsat to uh, substitute, uh, substitute um, some of these. Um, I, I wanted to close with, um, you know, how we're using this data because I started by, by telling you guys that we are interested on, on, on making this a management system, uh, not, not so much a water budget, but, but you know, we want to tell our, our people how much water they should be applying. And by how much water, I mean exactly how many gallons per week, not only gallons, but translated uh, to hours, so how many hours they need to run each pump, basically. Um, and these are just some of them, so, some of the maps that we push out. Um, I'll go through through them very quickly. Um, you know, we are combining um, basically potential level of transpiration through through the KCVs and some measurement of water stress to account for spatial variability. Um, um, again, a clear example. We started working with these pixelated maps. And then we found out that growers really, um, people that work in the vineyard don't really care too much about this because of the drip irrigation issues they have. When they run the water, again, it's going to be run across, across the field on a, on, a per, on, a, on a uniform basis. So the only thing that they wanted to see was a solid color per vineyard with the average KCV in this case. In some cases, you might, you might want to report the 80 percentile or the 50 or the 75 percentile or something. But it's, again, an example of how you know, we can generate a lot of data, but when we think about, you know, pushing that data out to real users, I'm not, I'm not the user of this data, I'm just creating data for somebody else to use it. Um, we need to be very savvy on how we, how we make this transition. Um, and there's only a few, a few um, vineyard managers that can use, you know, this type of information. Most of them will want to see a solid color on a per vineyard basis, which is already a, a, big, a big improvement from what we used in the past. Even more, a lot of people don't want to see maps at all. They just want to see a table where, you know, there's a column here that says hours per week or gallons per week. And um, I was talking to a few people um, yesterday about, um, you know, some of the implications of our large scale. And, um, you know, we have, we have a few cases where a single person has to manage 6,000 acres. Um, you know, they, they really can, don't, they don't have enough time to go through all this data unless there's a single number that tells them how much water they need to be applying. So basically, what we're, what we're focusing is on setting the baseline of, of water use. Um, you know, we did this, all this this year for the first time, and we cover about 25,000 acres. Um, by next year, I'm, I'm hoping to cover 75, and but then by 2014, we're hoping to cover the 150,000 acres, if possible. Um, so what are the challenges? Well, there's the main one, Lanza. We need Lanza more than anybody else. So, um, you know, I'm, 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 uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm basically here to, to make a strong case, you know, support for Lanza. What, what do we need? Who do we need to talk to? Um, we, we need this thing. Um, we, we had a plan before the, the, the beginning of this season, which was to use either Lanza 5 or Lanza 7. Obviously, that plan was modified when Lanza 5, you know, went down. Um, then this thing, you know, people tend to think that California is always sunny and, um, you know, there, there's no clouds. But I guarantee you, we lost a lot of images this year uh, because of clouds. Um, so definitely, you know, uh, somebody somebody can come up with a with a with a solution for that. That would be great. Cover crops. Here's a, I don't know how much how well you can see it, but this is a vineyard that is barely growing, and all this is just cover crops. So the first estimates through Seabal or metric that we got here. You know, a lot of water being used, but none by the vineyard itself. It's all through the cover crop. So how, how can we separate between, you know, the cover crop and the vineyard? Um, this isn't an issue in, in corn because you get 100% ground coverage. In vineyards, you will never have 100% ground coverage, especially, and this is probably the worst case scenario that I've ever seen. Uh, <clears throat> in some cases, the cover crop is as tall as the trellis or taller. Uh, you, you can't even walk here. Um, drip irrigation, fantastic tool. But again, on a practical application uh, basis, 
you know, we, we were, were working with some other, some other companies, we're working with IBM, for example, to, uh, to design the, what I call the irrigation system of the future, you know. How can we deliver water on a differential rate within a vineyard? If a, our vineyards, you can have a vineyard that might be 200 acres. So you can, you can measure all these things through, through remote sensing. You can run metric, you can run CBOT, you can run um, you know, many, many different algorithms. Once you have the data, what do you do with it? How, how can you really deliver um, differential amounts of water within that particular vineyard? So that, that is, is definitely uh, um, a significant issue. I, I will rate that one as, as number one. Um, and this one is something that really gave me a, a, a few headaches this year. Um, I want to thank, uh, first of all, you know, um, Byron Clark and Brian Thorson from, from Seabal North America. Um, they, they were great working with us. And, um, you know, um, we, we are a private company, so we tend to look at everything on a slightly different way. And, and you know, they were patient enough to, to work with us through, through the loopholes to to process the data in a way that we can use it. Um, this thing is here just to give you kind of an idea of our scale. That's one of the wineries that we have, um, where each tank is, you know, some of these tanks can be half a million gallons of wine. Um, so it's a fairly large operation. And these are some of the people that work not only in the field, but processing the data as well. Um, and with that, thanks. And I don't know if I have time for any questions. Thank you.